Assalamu alaikum, I'm Carl Arundel and you're watching In Focus. Welcome back to the second part of our enlightening conversation with the former Somali Foreign Minister and Deputy Prime Minister, uh, Mohammed Abdullahi Omar. Assalamu alaikum, welcome Thank back Thank you. to Islam Channel and In Focus. Thank you. Now, we were last uh, talking uh, about the, uh, your bold attempts to maintain and develop a sort of infrastructure of government, Indeed, the sir. judicial, the uh, institutions of state and so on, and the difficulties that you'd encountered uh, and the successes that you had enjoyed. Indeed, um, by any measuring stick, the yeah. current humanitarian crisis right. in the Horn of Africa right. is one, I think you could say, of biblical proportions. Indeed, Somalia has been experiencing the worst famine the world has witnessed in a generation, right. uh, the result not least of uh, the worst drought in right. 60 years. Right. Now, the UN estimates that a quarter of the Somali population yeah. has been displaced, some 1.5 million people, right. and more than 10 million are in need of immediate food assistance, yeah. or they will face starvation. Sure. In your opinion, could the international community have done more to avert this humanitarian crisis? Should there not have been more uh, d decisive responses to the obvious uh, uh, warning signs long before now? Indeed so. And I think this is, not, this is an issue that affects the, the Horn of Africa as a whole. And if I may uh, go back to the 1984 uh, scenario, and again in 1993, uh, and again in 2009, and in 2009 there was a drought, and I per personally uh, took charge of that on behalf of the cabinet at the time, uh, the, uh, the drought and the lack of rains at the time. Now, uh, uh, the 10 million therefore comes from the whole of the Horn, including Kenya and Ethiopia, Eritrea, Djibouti and Somalia. So it is a sub-regional problem. And Ethiopia was the biggest uh, sufferer in 1984. And again, 1993, 94, it was Somalia and Ethiopia. So this cycle keeps coming back. In Ethiopia, in, eight, in the 80s and the 90s, it was aggravated by the war that was happening in Ethiopia at the time. And similarly today, the whole issue is aggravated and made all the, more, all the worse by the war that is going on at the moment. So, but it could have been to some extent known. That I do agree and I do grant because the data is there. Uh, and I know that the data is there and international institutions have got the data. The Somali government doesn't have the data uh, because of all the, you know, we live in a uh, sort of a cocoon in Mogadishu and uh, the capacity is not there to predict on this sort of scale. But it did, the information was there, and the UN system should have alerted the world much earlier, and steps should have been taken well in advance. But I think, again, the world is so much glued to this issue of the war that a lot of things that could have been done get missed, and until it becomes, you know, extreme, people don't really take too much so notice. So you do not accept, for example, the idea that there was some sort of conspiracy, a, a clear decision to do nothing? No, I don't think there was a conspiracy. I think the, 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 some of the international, some of the UN organizations did highlight some of these issues in advance of the drought as it came to be. But I think t they were not taken, the issues were not taken at the right level, the decisions were not taken at the right level. And I think, but if the drums had been beaten much louder, and if the Somali government had been alerted to also uh, beat the drums and uh, alert everybody, then uh, much more could have been done in advance. Now, it's been reported just last week that hundreds of thousands of Somalis are being deprived of critical food aid after the banning by Al-Shabaab of the International Food Agency, the International Committee of the Red Cross, yes. uh, from areas under their control. Yes. The aid group suspended itself, the distribution to 1.1 million people in the southern and central parts of Somalia as of the 12th of last month. Yes. Uh, Al-Shabaab have justified this ban with accusations that the Red Cross were delivering out-of-date food. They said, and I quote, despite being offered 
unrivaled access to all the regions governed by the Mujahideen in South and Central Somalia, the International Committee of the Red Cross has repeatedly betrayed the trust conferred on it by the local population. What do you think Al-Shabaab were getting at when they spoke of betrayal of trust? And is food aid now being used as a political football? And what will this mean to the over a million people now dependent on that aid? Well, I do think it is being used as football. And I think it is also speaks volumes of the fact that when Shabaab is... Uh, uh, on the back foot and it is suffering uh, a certain level of pressure that it begins to apply this kind of ruling. I mean, at the end of the day, <coughs> one million people, Somali women and children and elderly people and men that are suffering need all the assistance that they can get, which to a large extent is or was being delivered by the ICRC. Now, if there is a technical issue, about the quality of the food, the date of expiry, all of these things. This is a technical issue. It does not warrant the banning of food that is meant to be delivered. And if this evidence can be you know, substantiated by Al-Shabaab, all they have to do is to show it to the world. This is the container of food that has been delivered, and this is the date that is stamped on the expiry date. Why do you have to make it such a problem without providing evidence. ICRC is an international organization. It's an audited organization. It's audited by its donors and it's audited by its board of uh, trustees or board of governors. We don't believe that it is in any way capable of doing that because it operates in so many other regions of the world. And there is no reason why it would pick on Somalis to deliver uh, expired food aid. So I don't believe that that argument holds. If it did hold, why did it happen? Let the ICRC respond. But it cannot be a conspiracy against the Somali people that would betray uh, their faith and trust in international NGOs or international organizations. These are there to assist the Somali people in whatever capacity, as they assist the people of Gaza or the people of Kosovo or the people of uh, Thailand when the floods hit. They are a humanitarian organization. Of, of world class. It's ironic, actually. When I was last there in 1994, when yeah. General Idid was in power, right. uh, I remember that uh, much food was sitting rotting in the warehouses in, in Mogadishu, yeah. and that it was, uh, interestingly, the uh, International Red Cross yeah. who repackaged it and managed uh, successfully to get that food out to the camp. So it's a slight, slight, slight turnaround Indeed, sir. now that Indeed, they're the sir. ones being accused. Yes, but so. at the end of the day, if there is an issue of the... Uh, quality of the food, then it's an issue that needs to be examined in its own right. So what is the solution to this access problem at the moment? Every day is a, a crucial issue. It there is. are people dying on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, uh, is the military option the only option on the table? No, it is not. And I think this is where we need the international community and the international NGOs to also begin to look at options. And one of the options is that, at the end of the day, whatever region of Somalia is talking, one is talking about, particularly in the southern parts of the country, there, the community has a structure, a community leaders, clan leaders, community activists, civil society are there, who are capable and are able to reach the communities in the field, in the inter hinterland and the rural areas. It is time that those structures were empowered and uh, facilitated to be able to participate and to take responsibility for the food aid deliveries that exist. I don't think since there is a war between the government and its forces and the Islamist groups, the community is there, the community has got its own structure. That structure must be empowered and must be supported and must be cooperated with by the international NGOs because those community uh, leaders and clan leaders are not political entities, they are social entities. But it is that aspect which has been overlooked in all the effort that has been made, welcome as it is, but this is a structure that needs to be uplifted.
talking about empowering yeah. the civil society, local communities, right. it's often been argued that the long-term foreign-sponsored formulas for solving crises have ended in failure, largely due because they deliberately ignored the main aspirations of the Somali people uh, for national sovereignty, territorial integrity and their right to self-determination. Two weeks from today, on the 23rd of February, senior representatives apparently from over 40 governments and multilateral organisations will come together in London with the aim of delivering apparently a new international approach to Somalia. They will discuss how the international community can step up its efforts uh, to tackle both the root causes and effects of the problem in the country. The list of objectives is published by the UK Foreign Office on their website. Right. It's somewhat lofty, some would argue, in your opinion, are these objectives realistic? I could read them out, but I think you... No, no, I think, I think, I think they are realistic, but I think the, the basic three areas are the way forward politically, given the fact that in August, the current transitional government's mandate as an institution and as a structure, given its own charter, it comes to an end. So there has to be a new momentum. Now, the whole issue has been that Somalia should move away from being a transitional state to a permanent government. That is where everybody is heading. So that we have a constitution, a parliament, an election, popular election. And the question is therefore how do we reach it and what are the mechanisms and the steps that are necessary. So I think it will be constructive. I think it is heading in the right direction. It is no Somali would want to remain in a transitional uh, status. Every Somali prays and hopes and works for the day when we will have a proper government like any other country. So I think the international community is now looking for ways and means for the counterparties in Somalia to enable the Somalis, and I think that is the objective of this conference, to enable the Somalis once and for all to actually come up with a solution. That is all the entities in Somalia that are currently in power regionally, Somaliland, Puntland, Galmudu, TFG, all of them are being brought together on this is reach a consensus. You need a new constitution, we need a new parliament, and we need new elections. Although indirect at this stage, but maybe in a year, two years, there will be direct elections. And secondarily, the issue of uh, extremism and the Islamists uh, issue. That also has to be addressed because that is now essentially a global issue. Uh, it is not lo it's no longer an issue of Somalis. Uh, whether, you know, we're talking about Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iraq, uh, today Somalia, Nigeria is affected already. Other countries are affected by this issue and therefore we have to find a solution in Somalia for the Somali problem. And if we can do that, then I think it all goes well for everywhere else. Now, but also let me point out here, per certain parts of Somalia, such as Somaliland and Puntland, have been very successful, and in some respects even more successful than many other full countries, holding elections, presidential elections, popular, one man, one vote systems, whereby proof of the pudding is that they have stability, they have social consensus, and they have social stability. So if it can be done in certain parts of Somalia, there is no reason why it cannot be done here. What we've got to do is we've got to translate, take a leaf out of that Somali success in those regions and transplant it here so that the same thing can happen. And I think that is what the international community is looking to do. Now, it's fair enough to look at the uh, neighbours uh, and their successes yeah. uh, and to follow that lead. But you did speak about the need for uh, meaningful engagement. Right. And, and you mentioned that most of the key stakeholders were being invited. It has been suggested uh, that uh, by many that, um, that some of the key uh, stakeholders are not invited to this particular conference, um, despite that being an absolute uh, prerequisite for there to be any meaningful outcome. Um, they are saying, some, that this is a conference to discuss Western interests in Somalia rather than the interests of the Somali people. Um, they have complained that uh, they are not at the table when they should. Do they have a point? Has this conference made any attempt, for example, to engage with the so-called Islamists? Well, I would suggest that I was myself present 
at various occasions, international summits, one of them being the summits of the Arab League itself, both in Libya as well as in Qatar. When every effort was made from our side as the TFG to establish a dialogue, whether it's direct or indirect, sadly, they have never ever been willing to come forward to a meeting to discuss. There is always the precondition. We will only start dialogue the day the last soldier from outside leaves the country. Now, I don't think that that is either logical or reasonable. In the midst of a war and a famine where the loss of life is daily, a daily occurrence in front of us and where we are responsible people on behalf of the Somali community, I don't think the situation allows or justifies any preconditions. But what does that mean? Does that mean a bit like not talking to the Taliban when you're discussing the future of Afghanistan? No, I can, can, you, can the conference have any meaningful results? I think it them? can. I think it can. Because if you can get from the TFG all the way to Somaliland to come to the conference, and the Islamists are, you know, their seat is vacant. They leave it vacant. It's not that they have not been invited, it's that they will not attend under any circumstances unless their preconditions are met. Now, no other entity, whether it is a Somali entity or an external entity, has put any preconditions. Therefore, for the whole issue to be folded up and to be put aside because one party requires preconditions which are unacceptable to the others. I don't think that's reasonable. Myself, I'm an MP today. I will seek every opportunity to engage, as every other Somali would. Clan elders would love to have that opportunity to happen. The TFG would love that to happen. Mediators, whether they're international organizations or other governments, that are involved and supporting Somalia, the OIC, the Arab League, the African Union, the United Nations. You choose any entity that you find comfortable. And through them, if necessary, or through their facilitation, we as the Somalis, and I speak here as an ordinary Somali, there is no justification for preconditions before we're even able to talk. We are ready to talk face to face, directly, without any mediation. OK, now, going back to William Hague's visit, sure. he, his recent visit, he said at that time, and I'm quoting him, one of the objectives of the conference in London was to strengthen counter-terrorism cooperation to make it easier for countries in this region to disrupt terrorist networks, sure. uh, to disrupt their financing and the movement of potential terrorists. Sure. He was joined, I think, by the mayor of Mogadishu, Mohammed Ahmed Nur, who warned that the 350,000 Somalis currently living in Britain, he said, um, could not afford to ignore uh, his country's problems. He, was, he said disaffected young British Somalis were leaving to train in al-Shabaab terror camps before returning to the UK, stating that whatever happens in Mogadishu in Somalia will happen in Great Britain. Has this threat of UK-grown militants, uh, again the subject of a report that was out today, funnily enough, by, by the think tank Rusi, uh, been exaggerated, or is it real? Are the attempts by the governments of the West to classify Somalia as the new hotbed of terrorist activity made with any reasonable justification? There are Somali communities that live across the globe far and wide. Uh, but... Even the events that happened in London previously, 7-7-2005, and I was here at the time, did not actually prove that Somalis were not, in essence, involved in those incidents. Uh, therefore, I think the issue is, to some extent, inflated, uh, although one cannot underestimate or take lightly any potentiality uh, related to security. Having said that, I think the majority of Somalis are 
normal human beings wishing to live and abide in peace uh, with their neighbors, whether it's in this country or in Somalia. Now, <clears throat> the point, every country needs to take its own precautions. And Somalia is in itself victim, and I think this is the issue which is not highlighted enough. 95% of Al-Shabaab are ordinary Somali young men, and even sometimes, you know, teenagers, who have never been to school, who have never traveled outside, who cannot speak a foreign language, who have probably never even lived in Mogadishu, they have lived in the hinterlands. They're ordinary children of farmers and uh, pastoralists and uh, small uh, uh, city and town uh, populations. There is no way that people such as that can threaten the United Kingdom or the United States or these countries. They just want a better life. But we must not underestimate that there is and there was hardcore of people that came from Al-Qaeda and Fazul, Muhammad who was recently uh, killed in Somalia, Nabhan who was recently killed in Somalia, and the uh, others who were, recent, uh, who were, who were killed uh, lately in Somalia, all prove that there is a hardcore of foreign extremists who are essentially the masterminds of their jihadist program and the financing funnel for the continuation of this activity. So we have to differentiate the, between the normal, ordinary young Somali guy who has no future and who's getting some sort of a salary and who, who, who has never known a government. 20-year-old Somali guy has never seen a government. He doesn't know what you're talking about when you say a president, government, cabinet, ministers. It, is, it doesn't gel. No. But, but there are people who have come from far and wide, who have grouped together and who have come to Somalia because they find it a safe haven to actually prepare and develop what they want. That group is a threat to everyone and they are a threat to Somalia. Now, there are six diplomatic missions yes, yeah. representing Djibouti, Bouti, yes. uh, Ethiopia, Libya, yeah. Sudan, Turkey and Yemen. Yeah. The UN Special Envoy to Somalia has moved to Mogadishu only last month. That's right. uh, is this renewed interest in Somalia to be welcomed? Yeah. Uh, and to what degree are Somalia's vast oil and gas reserves and other natural resources such as uranium played a role in the recent upscale interest in the region? Well, I think apart from the um, country representatives that you mentioned, there are also the, the Arab League also has an office, a functional office in Somalia. Um, IGAD and African Union and so on. So there is, uh, and these are people that I have worked with personally in that capacity, so yes. But there is interest in Somalia, I think, for the longer term. I think the interest is that this is a problem which has continued and which has sort of uh, began to involve everybody, the sub-region, the United Nations, all of these people. And it is a, it's a problem that no one has been able to stabilize and grapple with. But I believe the realization has now occurred that it is only the Somalis. However much they make a mess of it, it's their problem. They have to come with a solution. So it's best that we now give them the room and the space to, do, to come up with a proposition and a proposal. So I think that is one issue. The second, uh, sadly, yeah. we, we have come to the end of our time. Uh, but on, those profound, on that profound note, I think I'd like to thank you, Your Excellency you. Mohammed Abdul Bali, Balahi oh, wow. Omar, um, former... Uh, Foreign Secretary and Deputy Prime Minister in Somalia, thank you for joining us it's on InFocus.